everybody, this is Dwight Peters from PortalWaters.com, the site for social entrepreneurs, where we have successful social entrepreneurs come on our program and share their impact and business tips with aspiring social entrepreneurs. Today, we're going to find out how to get your brand on the shelf of Whole Foods. Um, today with us, we have the co-founder and president of Runa Amazon Gawaiusa. Wayusa, I'm sorry. Uh, it took me forever to figure out how to pronounce that. Wayusa, Wayusa. Uh, Tyler Gage. Tyler, welcome to the program, man. Yo, thanks a lot, Dwight. It's uh, great to be here. All right. So, um, you know, I, I did a little pre-interview research, and um, I found out something totally cool about your company. You know, Runa T empowers indigenous people by allowing them to earn income by growing Wayusa on rainforest land that would otherwise be sold to loggers. Me, I would have had no idea about this stuff, man. How did you get involved with this? Man, well, I, I definitely had no, not much idea about it uh, a while back. And uh, that was actually one of the things that interested me. I grew up, you know, in the suburbs in California. Um, and the Amazon had always fascinated me ever since I was a little kid. And uh, after my freshman year at college, um, I wanted to kind of adventure some more and get some actual experience and got invited by an ethnobotanist to help him do research in South America. Um, an ethnobotanist basically studies the relationship between plants and people. And this guy had spent 20 years uh, researching different indigenous plants and um, tribes in the Amazon. So that was a great kind of jumping off point for me. Um, and that was in 2005. So in 2005, I uh, kind of started and spent a few years um, in different parts of South America and uh, Peru and Ecuador and Brazil mostly, um, trying to just experience what reality is like for the indigenous people, um, both their uh, cultural practices, which many, many of which they maintain today, and also the struggles that they face to live as, as modern people, um, you know, send their kids to school and live in more of a global economy. And what shocked you and the most? I had a couple experiences where I'd what? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think we have a little lag, but I was asking you, what, what did you learn the most? What shocked you the most about that experience? Well, it was two things. First was um, one of the farmers I lived with, the guy named Carlos, he would always say that the rainforest is our supermarket and the rainforest is our pharmacy, um, which is true. You know, they gather their food, they gather medicinal plants from the rainforest. And also just what, one of the things that shocked me was they have very few opportunities to earn income. Uh, living in the rainforest. You know, their options are either moving to oil fields, you know, deforestation, maybe burning down the rainforest to grow corn, pretty limited options. And it really struck me how much they have to compromise their culture and their native identity to, quote, be modern. Um, and that sort of disconnect really struck me. So after that experience, what was next? First off, you that's an amazing opportunity with itself, being able to actually travel to the Amazon and to actually be able to come into such close proximity with the people to actually be a part of their culture. So you realize this and you see the way how they're living. You see the, the, immense, the immense lack of finances to these people down there. What set off the, what was the next step? I don't want to skip anything. So what was the next step after that? Uh, well, the next step, you know, I had a lot of experiences where I hear you wake up in the morning, you hear chainsaws cutting down hardwood trees um, so they can get some money to uh, sell the trees and feed their kids. Uh, I'm talking to the farmers. They're like, well, I don't like cutting down trees, but if it's feeding my kid or cutting down a tree, it's a pretty easy decision. Um, so started from that perspective, getting more interested in what other options could there be. And then I tried a Guayusa tea a few years back, you know, sitting around a fire and a in the Amazon, and I drank it, you know, it was maybe five in the morning, and it was like, wow, that's got a great flavor. Um, it had this, like, clean, smooth taste I'd, I'd never experienced from, from tea, and secondly, you know, a little while later, I started feeling a good boost of energy. Um, I was like, wow, this does pretty interesting. I wonder, you know, first I asked, had anyone ever sold this and realized that no one had ever commercialized it, um, and then second, wanted to learn more, more to see if that could be an option, so that was sort of the spark of uh, what has become Runa. All right. So, and the the thing that gave you the energized feeling, uh, this plant is it has caffeine in it. That's that's what gives it the kick. Hey, uh, are you still there? I think I'm. I don't know. I think I have a weak internet connection. Are you still there with me? Yeah. So we later. 
You still there? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, I got you. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, well, later we learned doing lots of phytochemical research that uh, in terms of flavor, guayusa has no tannins, which are what give green or black tea like some of the astringency. Okay. Like you know, if you leave a uh, green tea in the cup too long, it gets kind of bitter. Yeah. Um, which guayusa doesn't have. And then secondly, guayusa actually has more caffeine than any plant in the world uh, by dry weight. Um, so it packs so it a heavy a punch. Lot of, it packs a punch. You know, when it's brewed, it's it's uh, ends up being more caffeinated than any tea, and just about as much as a cup of coffee. Um, so that obviously was interesting to us, and is interesting to uh, a lot of people looking for alternative sources of energy. Um, so from there, I went back in my last semester of college. Uh, I took an entrepreneurship class and teamed up with some of my buddies, and we were shooting, part, part of the class was to write a business plan. Okay. So we're throwing around ideas of what could we do, and I said, well, hey guys, there's this kind of crazy Amazonian tea thing that we can maybe, you know, produce and make beverages. We're like, oh yeah, sounds like a great idea. Let's totally, we'll write a business plan about this. Um, and we started to do some research and look at uh, look at the market trends, look at um, new innovation, consumer demand, new product trends, and realized that actually there likely would be a pretty big demand for this kind of product. Um, functional beverages, energy beverages being a big market, um, more consumer interest in green products, fair trade, organic, that sort of stuff. Um, and then we were thankful we won our university's business plan competition, and then the Rhode Island State business plan competition. And which gave much, us some, you know, <laughs> we gave us one some cash. How much money did you get from those two awards combined, or two competitions combined? Uh, it was about seventy five thousand combined in right. both cash and services. Okay. Um, so it's pretty helpful to get going. So what and you... uh, from there we ended up graduating. All right. So after you guys graduated, you guys had seventy five thousand. Uh, what did you guys use that for? Well, we pretty much immediately packed our bags and moved down to Ecuador to start <laughs> the company. Um, so we kind of used it early on for mostly research and development of just figuring out what it would take in Ecuador to build up build up the supply chain. Um, so it was kind of early, early startup capital. Right. Um, and then from there, we spent most of 2009 and 2010 really building the supply chain in Ecuador. Uh, so working with farmers, building partnerships, figuring out how to grow it, how to harvest, how to dry, process, export, um, just very basics of the production. Um, and now today, kind of, kind of fast forward, we work with about 1,000 farmers that we support. Uh, we employ about 35 people on the ground in Ecuador. Uh, we build great partnerships with the indigenous communities, with um, USAID, the, the Ecuadorian government, um, a lot of other local agencies. So it's been a very collaborative effort to get things going. So you guys are making a great impact. Can you share with our viewers your revenues so far? Yeah, so this year we we, we launched products earlier this year uh, with a distribution for a few months. Um, we'll do about 260000 in revenue this year. Right. Um, which is pretty close to what our target was at the beginning. So we're kind of shocked that we actually, what, what, actually what got was your, there. What was your target? Uh, our target was like 275. All right. Um, so we got pretty close. Um, you guys are right on. And uh, so that's been good. And we've, um, to date, I mean, we've had to invest a lot in building the supply chain and just the production. And we're also proud we've generated about $55,000 of income for the farmers we work with in Ecuador. Awesome. Um, so we're pretty proud that we've, we're generating real income, real impact, for the farmers, um, and that's translating to additional investments in education, especially healthcare is a big thing they use income for. Um, so we're pretty proud to see that. Tyler, can you do me one favor? Um, can you turn off your camera and turn yeah. it back on? Let's see if that works. How's that? Uh, it didn't come back on yet. Yeah, your avatar is still on. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, you're a little clearer again. Um, so let's okay. keep talking about the impact a little bit more. So you guys are able to um, provide incomes for these workers down there. Tell us what their life would have been like if you guys weren't doing this. Like, what's the typical annual income for um, the Ecuadorians down there that you guys are working with? Yeah. So I mean, first we don't we don't actually employ farmers, and okay. we don't grow any of the guayusa plants ourselves. Okay. Our model is that we we train farmers to grow it on their lands. So it's really building their own productive capacity okay. as independent farmers and helping them run their farms as a business. Um, so from there, currently farmers make on average about four hundred and fifty dollars per year for their whole family. Um, that comes from a mix of 
slash and burn agriculture, so crops like corn, um, a little bit of cacao, chocolate. Um, a fair bit of that is illegal deforestation. They go in the mm-hmm. primary forest and cut down trees to sell. Okay. And a fair bit of it is migrant labor and uh, sort of miscellaneous day work they can pick up. So when you were when you were awoken by the sound of chainsaws, what was going on was exactly that, the illegal dis- deforestation. Uh, they were cutting down yeah. the trees. And it, right. I mean, it sort of sounds like, I don't know, kind of harsh, like illegal deforestation, which yeah, <laughs> technically it is. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, that's and the only resource they really do? have. Yeah. No, definitely. I totally and it, yeah. it, In many ways, we it sounds strange, but we actually approach deforestation as almost more of a social issue than an environmental issue. Hmm. In the sense that, you know, what's called forest degradation as opposed to deforestation is where they go in and cut down like big trees. Yeah. And actually, in many cases, ecologically, that's more destructive because the big trees play a really critical role in the integrity of the whole ecosystem, yeah. which is important. However, a bigger issue is some of these farmers, 60, 70, 80% of their income come from these trees. They grow, take maybe 30, 50, 100 years to grow. So what's happening is a lot of them are wiping out the trees they have access to. And as soon as that happens, they don't really have other sources of income. And what usually happens then is they say, well, I can't make money here, so I move to an oil field. Yeah. And all the kind of destructive cycle that happens there. So... We're trying to say, hey, actually, here's a more sustainable, um, culturally valuable, and much more profitable way that you can manage your farm and not have to sort of go down those other roads. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. All right, so you spend your time down there. Um, you guys did a lot of research. You guys were able to, to – uh, my camera. Let me get my camera back on. Uh, you guys were able to – Okay, you guys were able to truly understand the culture and see an opportunity there. Um, what was your next step after that? You said that you guys started to help the farmers grow them. You provided them an opportunity to grow the Wayusa. Wayusa. Um, what happened after that? What was next? Yeah, so we um, started doing lots of research, uh, building partnerships. Um, we got an early grant from from the uh, Ministry of Exports in Ecuador to build our first uh, pretty small um, processing facility. So we started doing that. And then once that was going, we started trying to launch products up here earlier this year. Um, And our early product development was pretty basic. (laughs) Uh, It was a lot of sort of blending different herbs to get different blends. Um, And we worked with a great design firm in San Francisco called Do Good Brands. Uh, part of the design firm Philippe Becker that helped us do all of our designs, which we're really pleased with. Um, and uh, and yeah, from there started putting the pieces together to launch our uh, our products and start getting them onto store shelves. What was your first step? Did you guys go straight to the store shelves, or did you sell online? Did you sell through your website first? We sold a bit online. Um, it was one of the things we did. We really realized that in our industry, you know, sort of food and beverage. Really, the um, the main bulk of the industry is in retail. So it's selling to natural food stores, whole foods, supermarkets, et cetera, and that's really where the business is done. Mm-hmm. Um, so we put a pretty heavy emphasis early on uh, to get on store shelves. Okay. So what was the first store shelf um, that you guys were able to get on, and how did that feel? It was great, man. So uh, the, <laughs> first, <can> <laughs> the first uh, account we got was actually Whole Foods, in the um, mid Atlantic region. Wait a second. So your first your first goal was Whole Foods. Whole Foods. I it thought, was. I thought yeah, you guys we were... actually built up, you know, smaller chain, smaller store, and then you got into Whole Foods. Your first shot was Whole Foods. How? Explain that. Yeah. So we got really lucky that we um we went to a show called the Fancy Food Show, okay. which is a big annual um, food trade show that happens in DC. Uh, there's also one in San Francisco. And we were there presenting, and one of the Whole Foods buyers walked by and saw the product and said, "Hey, this is great! Like, I really, really like this. Could we, you know, could you come in and talk to me?" So we went and presented the product to her. She was the Whole Foods buyer in the Mid Atlantic region, um, and she liked the product and brought it into the stores. So we just got pretty lucky that we had a. I think one of the main points of our one of the ways we present ourselves to buyers and a big. Um, I think a big point of difference is that our product really is not like a quote me too product or like a copycat. Okay. Um, and this is one of the big terms in entrepreneurship that I'm a big proponent of is the term dramatic difference. 
is there any new business, new innovation, um, new enterprise? You really want to think like, what, is, what about what I'm trying to do is dramatically different from what's currently going on? It's not like, hey, how am I maybe reshuffling a couple pieces or, you know, someone's doing green tea with mango and I'm doing green tea with peach. Yeah. Like, that's not really a dramatic difference. Yeah. Um, so, but Tyler, what we what do, do you, is we go to, but I, I, and I respect that, and I personally believe that, but what do you do when, for instance, I have a few business advisors, and what they tell me is, do I, you know, um, don't try to change the culture of consumerism too much. Like, I want to come out with a totally different, innovative product. A lot of people would say, don't try to change too much. What do you say to that? Yeah, that's, that's really good. That's sort of the, the other side, um, which is... Well, maybe speaking more concretely about how we think about it. Um, so for our products, we uh, basically, we go to buyers and we say, we have a way to expand your tea shelf with an offering that uh, competes on the platform of energy. So think about tea, think about green tea, black tea, herbal tea, the brands that are on shelves. Most of it's about either relaxation or sort of like your Asian green tea, which is really about health benefits. But no tea products really have that much caffeine yeah. um, and therefore can't really compete on energy. Whereas Guayusa, being a different species, has this very high caffeine content. So let's look at that as a baseline. Secondly, if you look across all beverage categories, you know, including wine, Coca-Cola, juice, anything, the fastest growing segment of the market is energy drinks, yeah. growing at about 16% per year. So from there, it's obvious to see there's a major consumer need and desire for the experience of more energy. And it makes sense. We live in a much faster paced society, lots of stress, people want energy. Um, so what we're saying is we're not trying to say there's a new need for, say, uh, I don't know, like, it's not a new need. It's identifying the core need, which consumers look for, okay. energy, and a different format to get that. Um, so people say, hey, I like tea, you know, like, I don't like coffee because it makes me jittery. I don't like coffee because it, uh, I don't like flavor, or I don't like energy drinks because they're all full of weird ingredients. They taste like crap, whatever it is. Yeah. But those kind of people still say I need some energy. So our dramatic difference is we're competing on a different platform from other tea companies, but still responding to a need which is accessible to consumers. So I think maybe to some extent answering your question, it's not, we're not trying to create a new need for consumers, um, yeah. whereas it's something sort of foreign, but it's energy of caffeine and a new delivery system, a new presentation for that, um, which is different from other products in our category that are on the market, if that makes sense. Awesome, no, totally understandable. All right, so you guys get on the shelf of Whole Foods. I, I know you guys are excited, but you guys want to make sure you're able to stay there. Uh, what changed in the culture of your business? Some, you know, you go from a small startup, and you're still you're still in the early stage, but now you guys have that responsibility. You're you're on the stage of Whole Food. You're on the shelf. Uh, what speak about the expectations you guys had? Yeah, so we. You know, we had expectations that we could obviously sell, sell a lot of Veruna. Um, I, I think it, kind of answering your question is there's that's the second phase. So phase one is get on the shelf, yeah. and phase two is get off the shelf. So if once once Whole Foods put the product on the shelf, it's our responsibility to, to make sure consumers come in and take it, buy it, and uh, drive sales that way. So most of what we've done is product demos where we go into stores, we set up a table where those – annoying people at stores that say, hi, would you like to try a new Amazon EMT and hand out samples? Um, I, I knew you looked for Which is a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> we, really, we really enjoy it. It's actually very effective. You know, we know at this point that we can sell out of half to two-thirds, or not, if not all, of a store's inventory doing one three- or four-hour demo. Because um, it's great. We know the flavor's different. People like the story. They can learn about it. We can interact with them. And that's really effective for getting products off the shelf. Um, and that's the majority of what we've done to date and will continue to be at least for next year. You know, we don't, yeah, we don't have a budget to run TV ads or do major sponsorships. Yeah, um, so that's the kind of really grassroots guerrilla um, tactic that's worked well for us. All right. So Tyler, I have a beverage company. I want to get it up and running. You know, it's a social enterprise. What do you advise? I think one, and this is where we tripped up a bit in the beginning, is first understand your um, consumer value proposition. So I think early on we were all about the mission, we're about creating impact, which is great. And I think to some extent we were too overly in that space. 
and we didn't early enough really hey, we need a beverage which can get the job done. If people will buy, people like, and that's it. Because if that works, we'll create impact just because of the way we built the supply chain. Um, so first, it's like if you're going to be a social enterprise which has business and a market mechanism as its core component, you've got to make sure that works. And I think we were maybe a little too top-heavy in the social mission. Um, not to forget that. Don't forget what your ultimate goal is. But uh-huh. it's like, well, hey, we could do like a green this or we could, you know, we could run carbon credit numbers on this. It's like, well, hold on. It's like, all right, well, ultimately, first, yes. First, you have to but, make money. You know, though. Yeah. Maybe first, like, do the basics. Yeah, get your model going and make sure things work. And then you can sort of expand that into additional realms of impact um, without losing sight of your mission. So I think that's, that's one, like, if it's a business-based social enterprise, the business has to work um, without the, the mission and social enterprise. Um, so the business itself, work. not good advice, the business itself has to work. Um, you guys are also, also B Corp certified. Speak about that. Yeah, B Corp's a great um, organization and new certification. Um, there's sort of two levels to it right now. What we are is we're, we're B Corp certified, um, actually as an LLC corporation. So we're Rhode Island LLC. And then B Corp as an organization has certified our operating principles okay. and corporate values to say Runa is at its core generating impact for society and acting in a socially responsible way. And it's actually written into our um, operating agreement and statutes that we look into, we consider um, multiple stakeholders and environmental impact, social impact in every decision we make as a company. And we don't solely exist to drive shareholder value. Um, so B Corp, B Corp um, sort of informally certifies companies under that, under their, that rubric of um, socially responsible standards. And secondly, what they're starting to do now, which is amazing, is they're starting to um, actually make a B Corporation its own type of legal entity in different okay. states. I don't know the full story. I think it's, it's already approved in a few states. I yeah. don't know which ones. Um, and we're not actually a legal B Corp, at least yet. Um, but I think that's really cool for entrepreneurs uh, being able now to set that up as the core of their business. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, Runa, you guys are looking to grow. Do you guys have anything new coming out? We do. Um, we're stoked. We're going to launch our line of bottled beverages in the spring. Uh, we're going to start launching through Whole Foods here in New York and uh, really focus on New York, expand from there. And that line's great. The flavors are awesome. It's only 50 calories in the whole bottle from organic fair trade cane sugar. I got some new designs rolling out with them. Um, and really excited to share that product with people. Did you guys think about that before? Did, did it ever come to your mind before to, hey, we should do a beverage? Or it was just the first idea, hey, let's sell the tea bags. And then it just happened to come, hey, why don't we do a beverage as well? Yeah, we, um, that was always our main goal ever since we wrote the business plan. Um, however, it's a lot bigger proposition. It took us some more time to get to where we are now to be able to launch that line. Um, so we always had it in, uh, in the back of our heads, but just didn't earlier on have the resources to launch that line. Okay, and cool. And so the Rune and Tea actually helped out a lot. One, he established a relationship with Whole Foods, so that that's the easier go as well. Um, I don't want to leave anything out, uh, and I feel like I am. Help me out. Uh, what else would you tell social entrepreneurs that are trying to, you know, create that product that will sell and also make that great impact in society? Yeah, I think there's one other. So when we started out, we had to build a whole new supply chain. We had to really invest heavily in Ecuador. It was a much, it was a very sort of overwhelming effort. And through that process, I kind of feel like we maybe bit off a little bit too much too early. <laughs> and sort of through the course of starting Rune, I've become a much bigger fan of um, really piloting anything and everything. So companies that can say, hey, I want to be a, you know, I want to be a chain of car washes, for example. I want to be in every state and a thousand different operations. You know, of course, that's your growth model. But it's like, what if you sort of took that big concept and found a pilot to do it on like a very, you know, small scale, little investment, use that, use that as like your toolbox to sort of work out the kinks, figure out the revenue model, the pricing, the input, the outputs, and really work out all the kinks in an early phase. Because mm-hmm. then when you start to scale, you'll save yourself all the headache of working out the kinks when you have, say, 10 car washes. And also, two, in our experience, particularly with investors, um, 
more and more, I think investors who are really smart don't just say, hey, you're a million dollar company. Wow, that's impressive. Like, here's some money. Even companies who are even a bit smaller, um, I wouldn't say it's across the board, but to some extent, if you can really show someone, hey, like, I figured out this game. Like, I've really figured out this recipe for success. I've tested it. I've tried it. I have metrics. I have numbers. And here's exactly what it'll take me to get to scale where I'll be making the millions that ultimately I will. I think more and more investors are smart to that or hip to that. Um, and if there's a way to do that, you can save yourself a lot of time and headache and also to bring a lot more value to your company. Because then when you go to say an investor, you're not saying, hey, I got this idea. I'm going to roll it out. I'm going to test it. You say, no, I know this will work. I've tried it. Like I've, I've found that sort of that niche that yeah. I've solved the puzzle and I just need money to scale that, which is a very different, uh, different proposition. And you can usually do that pretty cheaply if you're smart, so which we, we weren't. <laughs> so start out with a minimum viable product. It doesn't even have to be perfect. Just start small and make sure that you're able to truly understand your product and your market per se. And then, you know, take the steps to grow. Uh, in our pre-interview, um, you brought something also clear expectations you, you talked about that was um that was probably not a problem but probably an obstacle now that you look back on it that you would have um you guys would have dealt with a little bit differently can you speak about that a little yeah i think um part of that comes down to you know as a young company you're always trying to outsource you're trying to bring on like third-party warehouses maybe uh co-packers for products accountants, logistics partners, just about everything, yeah. um, designers, graphic designers. And as much as with projects, you can really manage expectation. Uh, we would have saved ourselves a lot of headache just in that really making sure that terms of engagement are very clear. Respons responsibilities are very well outlined. Timelines are very well outlined. And secondly, be very clear about, Hey, what happens if that doesn't happen? You know, Hey, how do we deal with that situation? Um, and also to sort of breaking things up into smaller segments. Tyler, can, great we're in. Can, can, you give us, can you give us an example? You have to go into detailed details, but can you give us an example of like one situation where you would say, yeah, man, I would have done this different in, in sure. conjunction with the clear expectations. Yeah. So, um, for example, we built our current website, which is okay. We're going to redo it, but we had one services from this design firm, and decided to you know, do a big project with them to do this big web development. Um, long story short, it took us about 14 months to get the thing done. Wow. It was like a, it was a pretty bad process for a number of reasons, but for example, the lead on our project ended up transferring to another firm, someone else came in, they got sick. Mm. Two months later, the company got acquired by a bigger company, and just the whole, the whole thing ended up for just a lot of reasons being just well, a very difficult process. Yeah. Um, and we ended up paying a lot up front, Mm. Um, we had done like an equity trade with the company to reduce our costs, which in general I'm a fan of, but the way we structured it just wasn't very smart at the time. Um, and we didn't give ourselves any outs to say, you know what, this just really isn't working. Like yeah. this isn't working. Like I want out now. Mm. And, uh, and we didn't have like a clear term or clear, um, ability to do so. Um, so that was one thing where we could have broken it up into like clear stages, you know, step by step by step. Yeah. So we could have paid them for like phase one and never gotten to phase two, three, four, five, six. Um, so things like that, I think, are important. Um, are they the same people that made your web, your current website? Gotcha. Check um, out your current website. Your current are. website is cool. It's, it's cool, but I guess there's some changes you guys want made to it. Yeah, we're, we're going to polish up with a new brand, which we're excited about. Um, and other things, too, like... I. I think it's something like this where like the, it wasn't really clear in the contract who was supposed to do, or there's some vague things in there. Like uh, the website will be like mobile, it'll have mobile capabilities or something, okay. which we had like understood to mean that they were going to make like a special website to really work on a smartphone. Yeah. When in reality, all it means is that if someone goes to the website from a smartphone, it's it will work. appear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just how it and looks like, on the desktop. Yeah. Yeah, so again, that partly was just our ignorance and our uh, lack of understanding, but they kind of made it seem a little bit like they were going to do a full mobile site, so we didn't really dive into it. Um, things like that are just, you know, we could have sat down and said, great, mobile site, let's hash out the bullet points of what this will look like, what are sort of verifiable illustrations of when we know this is done or when this isn't done, and, uh, and go from there. So get as m many details as possible. 
Get get that ironed out from the get go before you even get in any type of relationship with a third party. Make sure you get those fine lines properly addressed. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, are we leaving anything out? No, I mean just uh, I mean just personally, like I'm I'm very grateful for the people who supported us, other entrepreneurs, and I'm always happy to answer people's questions. If anyone wants to reach out directly, I can give my email, which is uh, Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R, at runa.org, R-U-N-A dot O-R-G. Um, so if anyone has questions or if I can be helpful in any way, I always love supporting other entrepreneurs and hearing about what other people are up to. Uh, people can follow us on Facebook and uh, Twitter and all that good stuff. We always throw out a lot of cool offers and fun stories from, uh, from the jungle. Um, runa.org is the website. You can get the stuff from there. We have some cool... Uh, holiday gift baskets going on right now. Some really cool products, some cool gift baskets with some unique items in there. If anyone's looking for some last minute gifts, um, that's always <laughs> a good good option. Um, and yeah, just good luck to everyone. It's a it's a noble path and one that takes a lot of uh, a lot of commitment. All right, cool man. I'm, 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 I'm going to start charging for getting these free plugs. <laughs> but now that's cool man. <laughs> Now, you, what you guys are doing is truly a great and um, very impressive thing, man. And, um, you know, here at Quarter Waters, man, that's what we focus on, just getting great people on the program that are willing to share their impact. And, um, you know, as equally important, some great business tips. So um, hopefully if anybody out there has a beverage company that they want to get on the shelf of Whole Foods, listen up and uh, make sure you apply these things. Tyler, man, thanks for coming on the program, man. Dwight, thanks a lot, man. You run a great show. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot, man.